Python trainer Reuven Lerner here with another question from Brett, who recently read my book, Python Workout, 50 Exercises to Improve Your Python Fluency. He also subscribes to my free weekly Better Developers newsletter. And Brett asks about modules. What happens when we use the import statement? What is it loading? Where is it loading from? And finally, what is the difference between a module, a package, and a distribution? All this is all jumbled up together, and even though the definitions are generally pretty clear, it's not always obvious what's going on. So let me try to give you a quick run through. First of all, it's a rare Python program that wants to do everything itself. Or I should say, it's a rare Python programmer who wants to do everything themselves. Rather, we want to use the work that other people did. As Larry Wall, who invented the Pro programming language, once said, good programmers are lazy programmers. That's to say, if we can get away without doing some work, we will do it. So the way that I can get away without doing so much work is I can use code that someone else has written. And if that code is generally available, then we call that a library. Or in the Python world, we call that a module. So I can use it with the import keyword. So for example, if I want to uh, get random integers, I can say import random, and then I can say print random randint from zero to 100. And sure enough, I get a random integer there. But what is this line doing? What is import random doing? So import is a keyword in Python. It's a statement in Python. It's not a function. So you can't say import parentheses random. Rather, we say import and then the name random. And import here is actually defining a new variable. It's defining the variable random. And if I say, hey, what's random? It's a module. So import basically defines a new uh, uh, variable of type module. And it then assigns into this module variable a whole bunch of attributes. What attributes does it assign? All the names that it found inside of the random module that it found on disk. That is to say, when I say import random, the first thing that Python does is it goes and looks for random.py or something like that. I'm not going to go into all the different possible ways that it can look for that file name here, but suffice it to say that's generally going to be a file called random.py. And in a moment I'll show you where it looks. What it does then is that it actually executes the code in that module, and that typically is going to be variable definitions, class definitions, function definitions. And all those definitions, anything defined in the uh, uh, global namespace inside of the module is then assigned to an attribute in the random module object that I now have. So if I say dir on random, I'm going to see a whole lot of names here. And these names, other than the dunder names that are sort of automatically created, all these names were originally created inside of random.py. They were defined there. If it's a variable, then it was with assignment. If it's a class, then it was with a class keyword. If it's a function, then it was done with the def keyword. And so all these things are now defined inside of random. And I can access them by doing random dot something or other. So once again, random dot random randint from let's say 100 to 1000 here, and I'll get a random number. Okay, so how does Python know where to find this module? Well, it turns out if I load the sys module, and it's a, not exactly true that I have to load sys. Sys is always in Python, but I have to create the variable that I'll have access to it. I can say sys.path. And sys.path is a list of strings that's constructed when Python starts up that tells Python where to look. And it's going to start at the top and continue. So it's going to look on my desktop, because that's where I'm running Jupyter. Then it's going to look here, then it's going to look here, then it's going to look here. And when I say import random, it's going to look here on my desktop for random.py. Then it's going to look here for random.py. This is the Python 3.8 zip file. That's where the whole Python standard library is located. Then it's going to look here. Then it's going to look here. It's going to look in site packages, which is where things are installed when we download a distribution and install it with pip. More on that in a moment. It looks in all these different places. The first place that matches is what is loaded. So if you have a file called random.py in each of these directories, each of them is going to be ignored completely except for the first one that matches. So you have to be a little bit careful when you define a new module or even a new program uh, if you have a name that conflicts with one of the built-in modules. So if I say import random, Python looks for random.py, in sys.path, the first one wins, it executes the file, end of story. Well, not exactly. Not exactly end of story because sometimes you'll have a bunch of modules that should be associated with each other. And you don't want to put everything in one big file. You don't want to have them in separate files that then people need to know and understand to install one at a time. So it becomes a little tricky. What we'd like to do is be able to say, these modules are related to one another. And that's done with a package. A package is basically a directory containing a bunch of modules. And that directory can be placed in any of these places, in any of the places in sys.path. Here's an example. If I say import XML, 
it looks, it feels like a module. Indeed, if I say here, what's the type of XML? Python says it's a module, and it is a module object. But if I then say, hey, XML, show me your printed representation, it's going to tell me where it was loaded from. And you can see a telltale sign here that XML is a directory name, and then it has inside of it dunderinit.py. That's a giveaway showing that XML is not really a module on disk. Rather, it's a package. It's a collection of modules within a directory. And indeed, if I copy this directory name here, I'm going to use the Jupyter ls command to look at all the files in that. Yeah, let's do, in fact, let's do ls minus l. So what we're going to see here is in this directory, which comes with the Python standard library, we have a bunch of files and directories. We have this init py, which used to be necessary. It's no longer necessary in order to basically declare a directory to be a package. And it can have some stuff on its own that it executes. We're not going to go into that now. It has pycache, that's where the uh, compiled PYC files go. And then has a bunch of directories under it. Each of those is then a package. So if I now look, let's just take a quick look here. If I'm gonna look under XML and eTree, you'll now see that there are a whole bunch of things defined in here. So this is a package containing modules. So you see that packages are not only useful for containing a bunch of different modules in the same space, but they are also useful because I can have a package inside of a package inside of a package ad infinitum or if you really hate it, ad nauseum, I guess. So basically what I can do is I can have my own hierarchy of modules using packages in this way. Um, and so when I load it up using uh, import, so I can say here, for example, import XML, which I already did. Can I say import XML dot, for example, eTree? Yeah, I can. I can also say from XML import eTree. And in all these different ways, Python knows how to navigate through this package one little bit at a time going deeper and deeper into it and loading the appropriate thing so those are modules and those are uh, uh, packages but it is extraordinarily common to get confused between these packages and another kind of package and what i'm talking about is what i've shown you so far is random and xml these are part of the standard library the stuff that's installed automatically with python when you download and put it on your computer but what if you want to have some third party um, uh, modules or packages. For example, Django or Flask or Requests or any of a lot of others. Well, then you're going to go to pypi.org. And pypi is a website. It is the Python package index. And this is where all sorts of third party contributed packages are located. So if you're thinking, ah, okay, now I get it. Those are packages just like I have packages on my system. The answer is no. That would be too simple. That would be too straightforward. It turns out that the term package is actually used in two totally different ways. There are packages on our computer that have a folder containing modules or a directory containing modules. And then there are packages on PyPI, which we should actually call distributions or distribution packages. And the distribution package contains, in addition to all the regular package stuff, an extra directory on top with metadata saying it's this version, it depends on these other things, here's the copyright, here's the author, and so on and so forth. Um, so that, for example, when you want to install one of these distributions, your computer will know, and we'll see how to install in a moment, your computer will know what to install along with it to make sure that it's not all on its own, that, that you don't have broken dependencies. So if I want to, I can browse through PyPI. It's I've got all sorts of great stuff here. Look, emoji. Who would not love to have an emoji package for Python? Fantastic. So I can say import emoji, print emoji, emojis, Python is thumbs up, and we'll get that. Wow, sounds like amazing functionality. How was I able to live without it? How, how was I able to communicate with my teenage children without this? Heaven knows. So let's say I love this so much, I must use it. So I'm going to go back to Jupyter now. It's a little weird to use Jupyter to install these things because the way that I'm going to install it is using a command line program. You do not install distributed packages from within Python. Rather, you install them from the command line, typically using a program called pip. So I'm going to say here, I'm going to use Jupyter because I love being in Jupyter. I'm going to say exclamation point, which means run this on the command line. Pip3, oh, actually, I'm going to do it the, the modern way. Python 3m pip install. And what was it called here? Let's just get here. Emoji. So I'm going to say here emoji. So what's going to happen? Well, I'm running pip install, and this is the modern way to do it because it avoids all sorts of hassles in terms of the environment and so on and so forth. So I'm going to install the emoji package, meaning the pip module that's located on my machine is going to go out to PyPI, find the appropriate file to download, download it, install it, and get it ready for me to use. So off it goes. It's now going to collect emoji, download it, it's going to build it, it's going to install it. 
Fantastic. And now I can say import emoji. Look at that. It's imported. It's as if it were located on my computer all the time, but of course it's not. Wait a second. Where was it loaded from? So if I now say emoji, just like I did before to the XML package, we'll see that it's located in this location, user local lib python 3.8 site packages emoji. Now, understand that it will probably be in a different location on your computer until the site packages part. This initial part is very, very, very dependent on your installation, your configuration. Um, but site packages is where pip typically installs things. By the way, you might also have permission issues because I'm using Homebrew on my Mac, so I don't have to worry about that so much. I did it on, under my permissions. And so if we look there at that directory, what's located inside? And we see here there's init.py, which sets it up as a package, and we've got core and Unicode codes. Yeah, so it's not a very large uh, um, package that we downloaded, but it is one. And what it included was a whole bunch of metadata. So when I said pip install, it went to PyPI, downloaded the distribution package, and then installed the actual package. Now the package isn't located in user local lib Python 3.8 site packages, which if I look in sys.path, is sure enough right there, user local lib Python 3.8 site packages. So pip is in sync with my Python installation and knows where to put these packages. Okay, so we then see modules, individual files packages, directories containing files, or other directories, and distribution packages which are located at PyPI, which we can download using the command line pip program. Um, and inside of any of these module files, you just got a bunch of definitions. And it seems really simple because it is simple. Oh, wait, let's just try one more thing just to make sure this emoji works, right? Because, you know, how can I resist having a thumbs up in my Jupyter Notebook here? So now that I've loaded it, I can say here, uh, oh, it helps to use print, not rent. And there we go. Python is thumbs up. Now I'm cool like my children, or so I try to tell them. Okay, Brett, thank you so much for this question and all of them. If you have questions or comments, contact me on Twitter via email. If you want to learn more about Python every week, try subscribing to my free weekly Better Developers mailing list, and I'll be back soon with more answers to your Python questions.